the virtue concordia, harmony among the Roman people and between Rome and other nations. Applying this to a dental office, you need to build harmony between your patients and your office and office staff by focusing on your patients' needs. Consumers' practices are the key to practice profitability and growth. This is a subject that's been near to Howard's heart for years, focusing on consumerism in your dental practice, and today he has more new information to share with us. Thank you, Judith. When we're talking about building harmony between the Roman people um, and other nations and between Rome and Romans peoples, um, we have to look at existing social networks. Um, you can break down a community by schools, churches, uh, not-for-profits, uh, but church is a very big thing in the United States and for the most part of the world. Um, I think 82% of Americans um, claim to be some religion, go to some church, uh, some religious affiliation. And we, you really need to pay attention to churches because uh, there's a lot of innovation going on churches. Uh, 20 U.S. churches now have an average weekly congregation of over 20,000. Uh, my favorite is uh, that Joel, uh, what's his name, Joel um, Olstein? And uh, he just bought the uh, center down in Houston. Unbelievable. And, you know, when we grew up, we were Catholic and, uh, we went to Mass every single day um, that we ever lived until we left home. And, and um, you have to admit, as a kid, um, they're kind of boring, especially from birth to 10 when they were um, spoken in Latin and the priest faced the altar and you had no idea what he was even saying. And uh, the songs sound like someone uh, wrote them um, in a state of depression. And now you see uh, modern churches that are growing the fastest, having uh, uh, music with you know electric guitars and keyboards. Uh, making it very relevant, making the kids have fun to go. Um, these churches have redesigned their church on the basis of consumer research. Um, out went 200-year-old hymns, pulpits, and church-like buildings. Uh, um, in came information booths, food courts, reggae services, um, services with PowerPoint presentations. Um, basically, religion breaks down the United States. The largest religion is obviously... Uh, Catholic, uh, 68 million Americans are Catholic, which is 36%. Um, next to be Baptist at 22%, Methodist 8%, Pentecostal 6%, Lutheran 5%, Latter-day Saints 3%. What Judith and I did is when we opened up in our community, um, it's Phoenix, Arizona, but it's called Ahwatukee, and <clears throat> it's the southernmost tip of uh, Phoenix, which touches Tempe and Chandler. Um, we identified when we opened about 20 churches. And my two older sisters are nuns, and someone was doing their dental work for free and weren't charging them. So what I did, and Judith did, is we went to each one of the churches, and we said, you know, someone's doing my sister's, uh, and we went to Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Pentecost, and everyone in our uh, 85044 and 85048. And we said, look, someone's doing my sister's dentistry for free. So first of all, I want to extend that, return the favor, and do everyone, um, you know, the, the minister and, or the priest or whoever for free. But more importantly, um, charity, the, the, the main thing with charity is the dangerous part of charity is it becomes incentives for wild coyotes not to learn how to hunt and feed for themselves. People need to learn how to fish. They don't need free fish. And giving out charity <clears throat> can be very dangerous. You only have to look at the welfare system to see how that destroys incentives um, for people to work. Arizona, 26% of the land is Indian Reservation. And it's just so clearly how when they're guaranteed a paycheck, it's, it's a huge disincentive to work. Um, but these ministers, they know who's really in need. They know who's in a bad spot. They know who's in a bad place. I would give them my business cards, and I would tell them that, you know, if you, if you sign, turn this card over and you write, uh, please take care of Jim or Jane or this family or what have you, um, I will fix them up just like I would want to be fixed up, and I will do it for free. Um, if it has your name and signature on it, I know it's legitimate charity that's in real need, and I'm not getting abused. I'm not getting, you know, I'm not doing free dentistry while they go buy, you know, a new GMC truck or something and go to Disneyland, that it's really, really real. And uh, what was amazing with that is, I mean, we literally um, doing, mo we, we probably half the churches uh, took us up on it where we would do the minister and his wife and his children. And it was huge. I can't tell you how many times patients would say, 
Um, the reverend was in a sermon, he was making some example, and he mentioned you and your dental office, or this or that. I mean, we heard that all the time. Um, we would uh, fix up uh, families, and um, I remember um, we got um, four or five Romanian immigrant entire families, I think one from um, Ukraine, all, all, for the last 20 years, all kinds of stuff. And the ministers would put a little paragraph in the bulletin board say, we'd like to thank Howard and Judith Ferran uh, for basically um, taking care of the Smith family or this or that. They had a time of crisis. And it was just massive PR. It was bullseye charity. Um, it resulted in hordes of new patients. I, and then one of what was really interesting is um, some of the first cosmetic dentistry I did um, was uh, on the reverend's teeth. I, I think literally one of the first veneer cases I ever did was actually on a, um, a minister uh, about a, two blocks from my house. And uh, we did 10 upper veneers, bleached his lower teeth. And I can't tell you how many veneer cases we did just in that. And what was so cute about it is most of them were 60, 70, 80 year old ladies who were basically in love with the minister. And they just come, oh, he's so handsome. His teeth look so great. Oh my God, can you do that for me? And, and uh, the reverend just, he just went on and on and on about his veneers, how he liked it. And he felt that, you know, standing up in front of a congregation every Sunday, it was very important that he had uh, very good looking teeth and all this stuff. And, um, and also, um, it's funny how when you grow older, things change. But, you know, if you'd asked me when I was 30, what's the chance I would be watching a television televangelist? I would say oh, about one in eight trillion. I'd hit, be hit by a meteorite twice. And then this Joel Osteen comes on television with these powerful 30-minute sermons that, you know, in Catholic Mass, I can't tell you. I'd say 80% of the time they skip the sermon. It was just all rituals and Latin and all this. And this Joel Osteen goes out there and uh, never told my kids I had to watch. I turned that on the big screen, and the four kids walk out there. And I remember one sermon he was given where he was saying that, you know, you have to be teachable. Um, you have to stay. You can't take correction with rejection. And everything he says is upbeat, positive, psychology, um, interpersonal, social, and probably maybe 10% of the Bible. I mean, it's so relevant. And uh, it was just so um, romantic to see a couple days later, my oldest boy, Eric, um, talking to Greg, and Greg had a little attitude about what Greg was Eric saying, and Eric's just repeating it verbatim. Now, Greg, you got to stay um, teachable. You can't take correction with rejection. Remember what Joel Osteen said on TV? And Greg's like, yeah, you're right. Okay, I'm sorry. And it's like, I can't ever remember going home after a Catholic mass and learning some lesson that I would share with my five sisters. I mean, I, I just don't remember that. So remember what was uh, perfect and what the priest and the, and the bishops and the cardinals and the pope, what they all thought was really, really relevant, wasn't really relevant. Because, I mean, the, the, this is the brutal truth about Catholicism. Um, the Catholic Church had 95% market share in 1500 in Europe. Well, now they don't even have 15% market share. Every single person that's in a Baptist church, Methodist church, Pentecostal, Lutheran, Mormon, Latter-day Saints, they all left these, uh, this, this first main church um, 500 years ago. And the Catholic Church has lost market share every single decade for 500 years, and I expect them to keep doing the same. Um, these other churches are innovating, and, um, and so look at these other social networks and realize that, you know, if you tap into a congregation with a thousand people, and it doesn't matter if you're the same religion or, or a different religion, uh, you figure everyone's praying to the same God, um, but focus in on existing social networks. You can do the same thing from getting involved with your school. Um, you know, my, um, my boys, uh, we're a big wrestling family. And, uh, you know, make free mouth guards to the wrestling team. Next thing you know, you're the wrestling team um, dentist or this or that. And, and it's also a third-party endorsement. People, social animals like humans don't like to make all the decisions for themselves and saying, uh, um, you, know, I, you know, I'm going to choose my dentist or I'm going to choose my cardiologist. They like to have some third-party verification that this is a good deal. And, you know, when a congregation knows the minister goes to you, that's a pretty good third-party endorsement. Um, we would go into the schools every February is Dental Health Month, and they have they let you come in and speak to the third graders. Uh, Procter and Gamble, uh, Crest, uh, they give you all kinds of materials you can take in. Uh, a lot of times they'll give you free toothbrushes or things like that. But when little Amy comes home from the third grade, 
and she has this little dental mart, dental kit that has toothbrush, toothpaste, sugarless gum, uh, things to color, good snacks versus bad snacks, uh, things like that. Mom started thinking, wow, you know, this school here, this is our school. There's 40, 50 dentists in the neighborhood, but they had Dr. Ferran come in. Um, they see that as some type of third party endorsement and it builds credibility. Um, so third party service providers are big, huge social networks. I mean, think of how huge uh, Benco is and how good of a job uh, Chuck Cohen is doing with Benco. I mean, Benco's uh, probably one of the most outstanding uh, so, uh, dealers. Um, Henry Schein with Stan Bergman doing an outstanding job. Uh, Pete Frechette over at Patterson. Burkhart's doing great. Look at Fred Joyle at 1-800-Dentist. This is a company where pretty much any dentist could call 1-800-Dentist and ask for Fred Joyle and he'd get on the phone with you for an hour. Uh, not because he has to, not because he thinks that's the way to build his business, just because he's passionate about marketing. And, how, and, and Fred's always telling me, why is it 99% of dentists have all their teeth at 65 and one third of Americans don't? Um, how much better, I mean, do we really need technology or do we really need to get existing patients in um, to, for the existing technology? And uh, Fred Joyle, I mean, I was building my website and I asked him for some pointers. And I mean, my gosh, he just, I mean, he, um, his website developers, they talked to us for hours. Um, by seeing your vendors as part of your value chain. I mean, pr pretend you had a newspaper and you bought a million dollars worth of paper a year from a paper company. And the paper company bought a million dollars worth of uh, uh, pulp from a lumber yard, a, a forest. And uh, it's so important that you three, you guys all work together because l for, imagine your paper was, uh, say, it was, say it was 60 inches wide and they delivered the paper 66 inches wide. And the first thing you had to do is buy a $1 million machine and trim six inches off this web. Well, now you have another machine, you got eight more employees, you have all this added cost. And the guy making the paper, I mean, that paper didn't come from anywhere. He had to buy pulp and he had to make the paper. But by all working together, you say, you know, um, I don't want it 66 and I want it delivered 60. And the guy selling the paper is like, well, God, that'd save me uh, six inches out of uh, 66. That'd drop my cost 8%. Um, I'll, I'll change the machine. And uh, by everyone working together, um, a DVD went from 800 to $30 in seven years. Uh, they worked the entire value chain, all the suppliers, all the vendors. What can we do? What, what, can we add this function on this chip so you don't have to buy this part? And um, Bob is at a den mat. Unbelievable. The guy's like 70 years old and a huge company and you call him on the phone. It's not just me. I mean, call there and ask for Bob Ibsen. They don't, they don't ask, well, who is this? This is Howard Fran. Or, I mean, they, they, just, um, they just take the call. And um, my gosh, you can, uh, um, he'll explain every product he's got to you. He'll send you tapes. He'll send you materials. These guys know that they're joined at the hip to you. Dan Fisher's another one. I mean, every month, Ultradent puts on a two-day hands-on course at their facilities. You got to meet the scientists making the products. You got to meet Dan. You got to talk to these people. And so many times dentists, um, they're on some type of inflated self-esteem ego trip and they see all these people as vultures trying to sell them money and, and uh, reps will come by and say, can I have five minutes time with the doctor? And he's like, no, or he'll make them stand up front for half an hour, then tell them no. Um, you treat the value chain with respect. They have so much information about best practices. Um, you know, um, Benco can tell you, you know, the successful dental offices do this. Um, why do you not take panos or this or that? And I mean, they can show you by them seeing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of practices, um, they're actually probably more connected than any consultant in dentistry. Um, go look in a consultant's office. What do they have? You know, 5, 10, 20, 30 employees. Um, go look at Shine. What do they have? A thousand reps in the field. What does Patterson have? Another thousand reps in the field. Uh, Densply has a thousand reps in the field. Uh, Denmat and Alterden, they, they, I mean, they have 30 or 60 uh, um, operators all day long fielding questions. They know what works, and you should see this value chain. I mean, if you buy um, supplies every month from Patterson, and they, you know, they come in the back door, and they deal with your assistant, they pull some tags and sneak out, you're missing a huge opportunity. Uh, maybe you should schedule an appointment where the rep comes in and does that from uh, 11 to 12 on every Tuesday. And then at 12, maybe you and him or her and your assistant maybe all go to lunch. 
and talk about what's going on. And he can sit down and say, um, you know, I've analyzed your fees and, you know, this root canal fee is too low or this one's too high or, or um, you know, or um, these are the materials that you're using. You know, you use a build-up material. It takes five minutes. According to its own instructions, it takes five minutes. Time is money. Um, here's another product where the whole thing will set up in one minute. And if you save four minutes on every crown you did for the rest of your life, I mean, you could retire a year early. And I know you think that's funny math or what they call Chinese math, but uh, it's all true. So remember, when you got your doctorate in dentistry, you got a doctorate in dentistry. And they should have said, congratulations, sir or ma'am. You got a doctorate in dentistry, but you don't know crap about anything else, okay? So, you know, it's okay if you're smart in spots as long as you stay in those spots. But just because you're a doctor in dentistry doesn't mean that you um, know marketing. That I mean, your yellow page ads make people cringe. I mean, uh, when you have a marketing expert who's not even associated with dentistry, flip to the yellow page ads. I mean, they literally, I mean, you know, these big ads say, you know, root canals, extractions, gum disease. Why don't you say bloodletting, leeches, pus, uh, we'll drain serious fluid, we'll scrape out tartar, we'll cut. I mean, it, you're scaring people. And you're a dentist and you think that's the information you would want, um, but you're not a consumer. So really work your value chain. Um, if you want to build a practice quickly, just simply go retail. Um, just ask Ray Kroc and McDonald's. McDonald's will open a brand new store and in its first month produce and collect 80% of its best month ever. From the first day out of the starting gate, McDonald's has well-trained management and staff. And why is it that we see dentists routinely take seven to nine years to reach 80% of their best month ever? Um, how come McDonald's does it in 30 days and you do it in seven to nine years? Um, I'll still say you don't even need to buy a practice. I mean, I would never buy a practice. I could open one from scratch uh, for 25, 30% of the money and have it up and uh, doing its best month ever right out of the gate. You just have to know what you do. So why are you taking seven to nine years uh, to learn what you have to do. Um, it is a myth that you have to build a practice slowly and take an average of seven years to get a fee-for-service family practice dental office up and running. A focused factory dental health care facility, and I call it a focused factory because um, I really, really admire Regina Hertzlinger. She's a PhD medical economist from Harvard University. She wrote Market Driven Healthcare. I've talked to her several times on the phone. Um, she's an economist, so if you think your accountant's boring, uh, um, it's going to be uh, three times drier than uh, your worst accounting meeting. Um, but she is just so brilliant. She has so much math. And she talks about a focus factory as like a McDonald's. They, they do one thing and they do it perfect. Intel does one thing. They make a chip. They do it perfect. And they have basically eight attributes. They're consistent. Every time you go to McDonald's, it's a consistent experience. Uh, everybody, everything's clean. The bathrooms are clean. Um, to this day, when mom's driving down the interstate and you're on vacation headed to Disneyland and you, everyone's got to go to the bathroom and you, you get off the highway and there's a, a filling station, you know that that bathroom's going to look like, you know, six camels just used it and no toilet paper and you have to, you know, put on a scuba suit to wade to the toilet. And, uh, you know, McDonald's, literally, you could eat off the floor. It'll be clean, soap, toilet paper. Um, McDonald's is so consistent in their experience. I mean, um, if you use topical anesthesia before you give them a shot, um, they expect that every time. You can't just sometimes do it. Well, I'm in a hurry. I can't do it. Um, if you always ask them, they want nitrous, and, and, or you didn't offer it. Or, you know, you have to be consistent, especially with staff. I mean, every time they come in, they want to see the same staff, the same bat station, the same bat channel. Um, you got to be reliable. They need to know that when they call you up in distress, you've always seen them. That's why I named my dental office Today's Dental. I thought that was one of the largest, most important attributes in a dental care facility. Look at, look at health care and emergency rooms. Um, the primary place most consumers um, go is still the emergency room. And um, because that's when they need you and the emergency room's reliable, you know you can always drive down there. You'll probably have to wait four hours, but you'll get in. Um, you gotta have clear standards. Um, you know, they, when, you know, so many times people will say, um, you know, th this dentist, you know, did this crown, he had to redo it three times, it still doesn't feel right. Uh, but when they come in your office, you know, every time, um, it's seats. And, and you're working closely with your lab. I, I feel so sorry for labs. Uh, um, I was talking to Sean Keating the other day at Keating Dental Labs, and he says, 
Um, just like Joel Osteen would say on his uh, televangelist that, you know, some dentists are open-minded and they're teachable. And you can call up and say, you know, I really don't like that impression material you're using. Um, I'm having a hard time reading your margins. You don't give me enough reduction. And these dentists will come down there. Um, I've gone down and seen Sean um, at Keating Laboratories. And I've gone down to Burkhardt. And I've gone down to Glidewell. And the thing I like the most about those labs is you can go in there and you can see hundreds and hundreds of impressions coming in. And I'll have to tell you, um, the bottom third of the impressions, they're shocking. Um, you couldn't see a margin. There's no reduction. Um, it is absolutely, I mean, this is F work. 30% of the impressions I see sent in in these big labs, and I like the big labs because it's a big sample. If you go to a small lab and they only work with five clients, um, they probably got rid of all the idiots who are always doing remakes and yelling at them and all that stuff. And these small labs of four or five people, um, you might see four or five really good dentists. Uh, but you go in a big lab and get a big sample, and I'm telling you, a third of these dentists, is, I'm, um, it's just shocking uh, what they sent in. And a lot of people, um, they are always on shopping in labs on low cost. What do you think costs you more, um, to uh, redo it three times or to pay a little extra money for a crown and have it drop in? Um, patients want convenience, and convenience is everything from uh, um, your parking lot um, I still see dental office have dental office where all the staff parks up front by the dental office. Um, so now your customers, you know, have to walk, you know, half a block to get to your office. Um, you should own your real estate. And you know what? If people can only come in from the main two-lane or four-lane street, that probably is okay for you, doctor, pulling in a BMW or a Porsche or Mercedes. Um, but what if you're a little grandma? What if you're a 78-year-old grandmother who can't hear in a Dodge? and it scares her to turn against traffic to come into your office and then you'll have like a side street on your building and you know McDonald's they would have an entrance and exit on that side street and an entrance and exit on the main street um, but you don't and I'll ask you why and you'll say well you know I don't know it costs a lot of money I looked into it. it'd be like uh, 10,000 or in architectural fees and city permits another 20,000 building I just don't want to dump $30,000 into it that is a real estate improvement and uh, improving real estate um, is always a good thing. And having all your money in paper stocks and paper bonds is a pretty scary thing, um, especially in a world of terrorism and things like that, where uh, that type of electronic information can be lost in an instant. Um, but owning land, buildings, real things that make stuff, that's real, real good investing. Uh, patient comfort. Um, when you're pulling someone's wisdom teeth, it's the only time in their life they'll pull their wisdom teeth. Um, you pull them, uh, you know, three times a week. It's no big deal to you, but you really stop each time and explain, hey, you got five types of nerves. Hot, cold, movement, pressure, pain. I'm going to numb up pain, and if you're feeling pain, you raise your left hand because I might be looking too close with your teeth with my magnification. I might not see your hand, but the assistant will see your hand, and if she doesn't, just reach up and um, tap her on the forehead. And, uh, and, but you will feel pressure, movement, hot, cold. So what I'm going to do, and I'll take an elevator, I said, I'm just going to go and I'm just going to push around your tooth so you'll feel pressure. But it's not pain, okay, because I can't numb you up to where you're, you know, if I numbed up your arm, you'd know if it was over your head, you'd know if it was behind your back, um, you'd know if you stuck in ice water, you know you'd stuck in an oven. Uh, I can numb it up and you still burn yourself. Uh, but you don't feel pain. It's a, it's a, it's a different uh, sensation, different nerve. And uh, so I'm going to push around that tooth, and then I, I go and I push all the way around the tooth, um, pushing in between the tooth and the um, tissue, and I push firm, very firm, because what that starts doing also is by loosening the attachment and damaging the periodontal ligament, you start swelling. And you got to remember hydraulics. Um, you, you couldn't lift a house, but if that house was sitting in a container of water, and you took a mile long rod and you know, little, little, that fit in a perfect hole, you could shove that rod in there and lift that house up. No problems. Hydraulic is the geometry to the infinite. And um, when you start really pushing deep on detaching that periodontal ligament, uh, first with the, with the big end and then turn around the small end, you start a massive swelling and trauma in that periodontal ligament. And as that swelling starts to swell, um, you're loosening up the tooth from the bone and uh, by going around checking each, each four wisdom teeth, um, you can, uh, how many times have you um, been elevating on a tooth and doesn't budge? 
So you keep elevating it and then you break it off. Now you have to dig it out, do surgery. And once you touch bird to bone, then you're talking about metarol dose packs, maybe preventive antibiotics. Um, you know, it's a lot more trauma. And now Dan Fisher was showing me up at Ultradent where um, he goes around with the, uh, per with the periosteal and then he has six periosteals, just get smaller and smaller and smaller, and, and, and they just get thinner. And each time you go around with another one, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And if you use all six, you'll pop the tooth out. I mean, it's unbelievable, not even an elevator. Can you imagine that? Just simply working your way down the periodontal ligament all the way around the tooth, and pretty soon the tooth just literally pops out. Uh, but you got you have to totally focus on patient comfort. Patients are scared of root canals. No one no one says, well, what are you doing on your wedding night? Oh, we're both going to have his and her root canals done. Um, go on a cruise. They'll give you a massage, a facial, a pedicure, a manicure. Uh, but they don't have root canals. I mean, nobody wants a root canal. And <clears throat> you do <clears throat> maybe one or two a day. This patient is their first one, or they've only had one other one in their lifetime when they're 50 years old and you really have to go through the patient comfort and, and touch their shoulder and reassure them, this is gonna be fine, it's no big deal, and just relax. We put televisions in the ceiling. Um, currently, as we're filming this, is the great New Orleans flood. Everybody's just so focused on this hurricane and this flood, and, uh, and you're reassuring them, and we're occupying their minds so at the time uh, they don't uh, focus on it. Um, quality is just imperative. Uh, best materials. Um, I, I love my best quality stories. Remember when uh, um, bonding was coming out and, and everyone was having sensitivity? That is everyone who called their patients that night and saw them on active recare. And there are all these, and saying, I don't get any sensitivity. And it's like, yeah, well, have you ever talked to any of your patients? And everyone was telling it was you. They're telling you, oh, well, you, you, you over dried the tooth, or you didn't dry it enough, or it was it's too wet or too dry, it's got to be just right, or you didn't have a rubber dam, or your rubber dam was leaking, or the, the, all these manufacturers just kept saying it's you, you, you. I'm out there lecturing every week, and I'm saying, how many people have their FAGD stand up, or their MAGD, they'd stand up? How many of you guys are getting sensitivity? And, you know, their hands would all go up, and it's like, really, how come it's the best dentist I know that are for real, million dollar practices, big time continuity, they're getting sensitive and then these manufacturers are getting dentists without dental offices to go around and tell everybody it's your fault. But the Japanese listened, um, Clearfill listened, and Clearfill came in with their Clearfill SC self-etching bonding agent, and uh, they had their chemistry sit right, and they had no sensitivity, and they got 60% of the U.S. bonding market in two years. Why? Because they had a quality product. They didn't have to do a lot of advertising. You didn't see lots of full-page ads, direct mails, free samples. You know who sold Clearfill SC? Happy, satisfied customer, dentist, talking about it on Dental Town. Everybody, it was just the rage on Dental Town for a year. Everybody switched. They'll never try any of those other ones. Um, and then last but at least, customer acceptance. I mean, what are you doing? Are the customers accepting it? Um, if, if you're doing this, and your church is losing market share every year for 500 years, at some point you have to say, um, we need more exciting songs, we need better sermons, we need better presentations. Let's look at the 20 churches with 20,000 attendees every week and say, why are they so huge? Why are they growing so fast? Why can they afford television? Um, why can't, uh, why are some offices doing two and a half million dollars a year, the dentist taking home 600, and in the same medical dental building, there's a dentist doing 300 a year, taking home 80. A consumer-focused dental delivery system is not organized by dental specialties that are provider-focused. They are organized by patient requirements. Your consumer-oriented family practice dental office should contain all the resources necessary for the patient's need, wants, and desires. Um, you know, it's pretty silly um, to walk into a hospital and uh, you have a broken arm and they say, well, you'll need a, a, a CAT scan or MRI, and to do that, you'll have to go over here, and it's two miles away, and then, or you're in a hospital, and you gotta go, you know, um, you know, 1,000 yards this way, and then you get the x-ray, and you say, uh, well, can you, uh, well, what's the deal? Oh, well, we can't read it. Uh, we just take them. You're gonna have to go to a radiologist and, and get in your car and make an appointment and all that. I mean, it's just crazy. I mean, it should be, I got a broken arm, let's go to a place, let's take the x-ray, let's read the x-ray, let's set it, if we got to put a pin in it, let's do it. Focus on the problem at hand. Um, we know, Regina Herzlinger's research says there's just massive, considerable evidence demonstrating that the quality of a medical procedure is directly related to how frequently doctors perform it, um, or its volume. Um, there's no doubt 
that an endodontist can do a, routinely do molar endos in under an hour. And it's no doubt that dentists that get out of dental school um, do it on three one-hour appointments. Now, who do you think did the root canal better? The endodontist who does it all day long and does the thing in under an hour, or some general dentist who does a hundred different things and takes them three one-hour appointments. And I'm telling you that the endodontist, since they know exactly what they're doing, and repetition is the mother of all invention, and, and necessity is the mother of all invention, they, they get really, really good at it. And we, Regina Herzlinger, PhD medical economist, Harvard University, has shown that the faster you do the procedure, the higher the quality is because the reason you're doing it fast is because you know exactly what you need to do next. And she did a hernia study. And the doctors who did the hernia surgery in, in like 25 minutes, they had like a 95% success rate, but if it took you like two hours, you had a 50% um, um, failure rate. So faster, and you know, Gordon Christian, many consider him the, the god of all dentistry. I mean, Gordon is just, I mean, what can you say about Gordon Arella? They're just a uh, legend in dentistry, I'm sure a thousand years from now, they'll say Pierre Fichard, G.V. Black, and Gordon Christian. And what is his most famous sellout course and his most famous sellout videotape? Faster, easier, higher quality dentistry. Faster and higher quality go hand in hand. Um, I take out all four wisdom teeth, usually between three and seven minutes. Imagine the doctor who's digging on one for an hour. Um, they simply don't have the equipment, the technology, the training. So, you know, um, when you're in that mid zone, where you're taking a long time and you, you, you don't know what you're doing, you have to commit to, I am going to take massive amounts of continuing education uh, until I get this procedure down. Um, tangible attributes inclu include a clean office, a friendly staff, satisfactory treatment, but intangible attributes have more to do with passion. Those are attributes are those that uh, occur when every visit caters to the individual, builds value, inspires loyalty, maintains thrill and passion, reiterates promise and exceeds desires. Satisfaction equals perception minus expectation. You have to exceed their expectations. It is sometimes referred to uh, by Tom Peters as the wow factor. And what I mean by passion is, you know, when your dental assistant is seating someone to have a root canal, I mean, she's on stage. Um, she is on stage um, at the theater in New York City, and she's got to be passionate and talking about it. Well, you're going to have a root canal, Jane, and it's going to be fine. Um, is the tooth bothering you? You know, you're going to feel better. And, and talk, 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 passion, passion. But if they're sitting there and no one mentions root canal, silence is death in a dental office. Um, remember physicians. Remember when you're little and you go to a physician, they say, okay, take off all your clothes and sit on this table in your birthday suit and the doctor will be here in just a minute. And then you're sitting in there for like 35, 40 minutes, butt naked, looking at a, a skull on a wall or a chart of some ribs. And is that <coughs> not the longest half hour of your entire life? And then finally in comes the doctor, oh, how are you? And sticks cold instruments all over you. Um, it's just not a wow experience. It's a dreadful experience and no one wants to go there. Um, in the old what and need syndrome, People will find money to buy what they want without addressing their needs because they see value in what they want, not what they need. The dental practice that truly succeeds is the one that creates a high need and a high want. Um, yeah, you want to whiten your teeth. Okay, they want whiter, brighter, sexier teeth. But you know, the whitening is not really going to work with all that plaque and tartar. So we got to go clean your teeth and we just measured your gums and you know, you got a lot of gum disease and you need root planting, curatage or whatever. And so I'm getting their need done because they want this big want. Oh, you broke off this tooth and went to a filling. Well, you know, you're 30, you've been drinking coffee and Dr. Pepper and tea for 20 years. Um, you know what, to really make this look awesome, why don't we first whiten your teeth but in order to do that and have it really work, we're going to need to have you go and get your teeth cleaned and go through perio one, two, three, four, five. And if we're going to be doing this one, uh, this tooth here, it's got this big black amalgam filling with recurrent decay. I think to have a really beautiful smile, you know, your front 10 teeth show very well upper and lower. Uh, we really, what, what we really need to do is these other two teeth when we also do what you want to do on your front tooth, but with passion and education, remember doctors, docere, Latin to teach. Um, I really need to do this to give you what you want. And uh, repetition is the mother of skill. Necessity is the mother of invention. Um, Chrysler, 
Um, look at their exit interview. I'm going outside of dentistry, and, and uh, um, their exit interview, every time you take your car in, one of my, uh, uh, my second car in life was a, uh, no, my third car was a Chrysler Baron convertible, and I loved it so much just because my four boys thought when the convertible went down, they just thought that was the coolest thing in the world, and they loved to go on uh, backcountry roads when they were little and put the seat back and stand up and drive down dirt roads and the wind blowing, and they just thought that was the neatest thing. And whenever I took my car into Chrysler, they always gave me an extra interview. Um, five deals. Number one, were you satisfied with the treatment you received from the service staff? I mean, staff and how they interact, did they make you mad? Did they say it in a way that made you feel bad? Remember, it's not what you say that matters in life. It's how you make people feel. I don't care what you say. If you make me feel bad, it's not working. You got to make people feel good. And you got to do it with the little stuff. Like, remember your little kid? Um, you didn't sit there when he took his first step and say, yeah, come back to me when you do a marathon. That's when I'll give you a thumbs up. You know, your little kid let go of the coffee table and took two steps and everybody's like, oh, Johnny, oh, wow. You made a big fuss over all the little things. You never sat back and then just give them a kudo when he, they did something big. You do that, they would have never done anything big. It's the same thing with your staff. Um, when you go in there and say, um, um, Jan, did you call that wisdom tooth patient uh, that we did a week ago? Did you call him last night because it's been a week? Are they doing okay? And she goes, yes, I call him. And you're just like, Jan, you're so awesome. How come I never have to check with you? Um, and you call that person. Did you talk? When did you call him? Oh, last night about 8 o'clock uh, um, after dinner, and I did the dishes. And I said, there, there you are, Jan. And, you know, you're at home, not clocked in, 8 o'clock. And you're so passionate that you so care because, you know, if you had an appendectomy a week ago, you'd love it if the nurse called you a week later to follow up to see how you were doing. And you just give massive kudos on all the little things, and that's what creates the big things. Um, it's like Judith was telling me, um, you know, when little kids, you know, they never share. Well, if you give a kid a cookie and tell him to go share it with his brother, um, that's a hard deal. I don't really want to give him half of my cookie. But if you give him ten cookies and tell him to go give his brother one, he'll do it. Then you're like, oh gosh, Eric, you're such an awesome big brother. The way you share with your little brother and you make such a big deal out of sharing when it's never painful. And as they get bigger, they share when it is painful and, and you, they just know that sharing makes them feel good. Uh, number two, did the service staff listen and understand your needs? Once again, the first two things, staff, staff, staff. Number three, were you satisfied with the service staff's ability to have your vehicle ready when promised. You know, we manage time and money. People, time, and money. That's, you know, that's all we manage. Business does three things, make something, sell something, watch the numbers, but we manage people, time, and money. Uh, was your car ready when you're promised? Um, your appointment, how can you not run on time? You tell someone you want them there at nine o'clock and they're there at four till, you seat them at nine. And when you can't seat them at nine, you have to track that and you have to ask yourself, how much of your patient's time are you wasting every day? And remember, the stakes are high. When I go into an office with 5,000 charts, 4,000 and 5,000 have not been in one single time in 24 months. That is the industry average. Uh, number four, if you receive a survey from Chrysler Corp, will you be able to answer it in a positive fashion? They want to run into there. And then once again, positive fashion, how do they make you feel? They didn't say, hey, did you get the alternator GC 101? Did you get the right fuel pump? Did you get the right motor oil? They're not talking about facts and figures. How did we make you feel? And number five is comments. Hey, you want to talk? Is something about that I didn't say? Um, the key measures of consumerism, um, time on the phone, necessary to make, um, make an appointment. Uh, I can't tell you that when I call, Dennis will call me all the time. And I make a religion out of being available. I give my home number. I give my cell phone number. Um, even though my uh, wife doesn't want me to give out the home number anymore. Uh, when they call, I always try to call back in a timely fashion. I can't tell you how many times I call. Can you please hold? And I'm sitting there for five, ten minutes. Finally, you know, the staff's getting me, and I just hang up. Um, the front office, it's the only link to the outside world. It should be one ring, pick it up. Thank you for calling today's dental. How may I help you? And they better have ten minutes easy to deal with you. And uh, that means that the hygienists have to reschedule their own, uh, schedule their own recall appointment. If you know every cleaning has to be scheduled for a recall, and the hygienist was just in there for an hour, they have the highest success chance. I mean, are you really going to tell a hygienist who she's been telling for an hour you don't floss, you don't brush good, you miss these spots, you got some gum disease, you're only 30, you do it this for another 20 years, you're going to lose these molars, yada, 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 yada. And then when she's all done, look at the page, say, hey, now do you want to schedule for your recall in three months or four months or six months? 
And you think they really have the cahoots to say, uh, nah, forget it. This is all stupid. Uh, they're like, yeah, you're right. I, I know I need to come back. I need, I need to floss more. I need to get in every three, four, five, six months. And, uh, and then schedule. If you know it has to be done, do it in the back. The other thing is like a crown prep. Uh, uh, when assistants have the front office schedule for a crown seat, uh, they might schedule like 20 minutes or 30 minutes. And then when the patient comes in at crown seat, the assistants are all mad like, what, what are you guys nuts? This lady's a freak. She wants nitrous, topical. We'll have to use septicane. It'll soak in for half an hour. Uh, this is an all-porcelain crown. We're going to have to numb it up and pack cord or this or that. Or, and, and the assistant's like, oh, so how much time do you need? An hour? So then the next crown seat, they schedule an hour. Then the assistant's like, oh, what are you doing? I mean, this is a crown. It's a PFM on a root canal. Uh, the guy's 80 years old. He's practically dead. He won't feel a thing. This will only take me 10 minutes. Why did you waste an hour? And the front office is always just confused. They ever, no matter what they do, they get attacked. But you know what? The assistant has the most information during this crown prep. Let the assistant schedule the, uh, the seat appointment. Um, let the hygienist, if you know it has to be done, from an operations and logistics point, it has to be done in the back because they will schedule the appropriate efficient amount of time because the front office is sales and marketing. When that phone rings, they need to be able to answer it, not put you on hold, talk to you for 10, 20 minutes. Thank you for calling today's dental. How may I help you? Um, the number of days needed to wait for an appointment is an atrocity in dentistry, and, the, it, and that's the, the heat of your whole cancellation, no-show, reschedule, broken appointment is. You always say that um, this patient canceled their appointment, but you made an appointment that he didn't ask for. He called you up and said, hey, can I get my teeth clean uh, today or tomorrow? And you say, no, I can't give you what you want but you need a cleaning and I'm going to book it out here two, four, eight, six weeks. And then when they don't come in for what they needed, then you get mad and say, this guy's a deadbeat. And you say, he's not an A patient or a B patient. He's a C or a D three strikes. He's out. And you have to give people what they want. Uh, I'd like to get my teeth in. Well, when would you like to come in? Well, I'd really like to come in today or tomorrow or this day. Well, okay, I got a cancellation, yada, yada, I can put you on my list. How about I'll call you back tomorrow morning, whatever. But those front office are sales and marketing, and they love it. When a mom will call up to make an appointment for little six-year-old Megan, she fell on the coffee table, she chipped her um, tooth or her lip, and she wants it seen, and she'll say, okay, she'll come in now. Um, now, has Megan had her teeth clean? When's the last time she had her teeth clean? Oh, she's actually never been to the dentist. Well, heck, let's just schedule for a new patient cleaning exam and x-rays, and doctor will check her tooth. Now, is that Megan your only baby? No, I got Billy and Bob, and they're like, well, hey, we have four hygienists. Uh, let's get Billy and Bob in here, and mom, uh, what about you? And she's oh my God, I haven't had my teeth clean in years. Well, why don't you, let's, let's schedule you an appointment. And then the, so many times I'll say, what about your husband? Oh, you know, I can't, you know, my husband hasn't been in for years and, you know, I don't know his schedule and you, you have to really deal without him. Well, great. Do you call him at work? I mean, does he have a cell phone? Is that okay? And because I can put you on hold, I'll dial a cell phone number and we'll have you both on the phone at the same time. Um, Frank, this is Jan at Today's Dental. I got your wife, Helen, on the phone. Uh, uh, Megan chipped her tooth and... And uh, we got her and Billy and Bob all scheduled, mom scheduled, and they're wondering, did you want to come in with the family, or does your work let you leave work, or do you need to come in at lunchtime, or what do, you, what do you need to do? And they'll come back to me, and they'll just smile, and they'll come back to me, and Dr. Fran, and they'll, they'll always tease me, and they'll say, Dr. Fran, you don't even pay me enough. This lady called up and wanted me to just to check some six-year-old's chipped tooth, some bruised lip, and I scheduled, it took me 30 minutes, and I had to call their insurance company. I scheduled five of them for a cleaning, and the whole family's coming in, and they're grinning, they're smiling. They're sales and marketing, and you have them doing some type of paperwork, insurance, billing, accounting job. Um, On-time performance of seating each dental patient is mandatory measured. Um, when these people are, when, um, when they come in and you're not on time, you have to stand up and you have to explain to them what's going on. Uh, um, if you know that doctor's running 20 minutes late, um, these patients have cell phones. This should be in your deal. You should call them up and say, I'm so sorry, Megan, but doctor's running 20 minutes late. He's had an emergency and they're not getting numb and they're really in a lot of pain. And, uh, you know, is that going to be okay? Or, or do you need to reschedule? And just the fact that you're showing empathy and concern is everything. Um, you know, there's a lot of research on uh, divorce and marriage counseling. And um, when you talk down to someone is the number one, when you're talking from a higher plane to a lower plane, that is the number one reason for not only divorce, but also lawsuits. These dental insurance companies, you know, there's not a lot of big lawsuits in dentistry, but medical insurance, especially OBGYN is huge. 
And for 40 years of tracking uh, the doctor's age and where he went to school and his grade point average, it never correlated with whether or not they're going to get sued. And then they found a new technique where they're going to insure a doctor. They go in there and they tape their consultations. And if they sense you're talking down to a patient, they don't insure you. They know you're going to get sued. Like a lady will come in and she'll say, well, you know, I'm feeling a pain down here and it's just kind of weird. And I don't know if on the hysterectomy if you got it all out or whatever. And she'll say, and the doctor will say, well, you know, I know you don't understand because I know you're not an obstetrician. You're not a doctor, but you know, you just kind of trust me. You're okay. I got it all out and you're okay. And this is all in your head. And she feels bad. And she leaves and she gets a second opinion or she go, contacts a lawyer. And, and you have to show massive empathy for not running on time. And if they have a toothache and you can't get them in today, yet your doctor's taking lunch or getting off early, um, it's not acceptable. Um, you got a toothache, you can't get it in, but you know what? Can, let me put you on hold because you're in pain and you're my patient and, and you're causing me pain. And I'm going to call my endodontist. And I'm going to call, I'm going to find you someone that's going to see you today. Or maybe it's that new dentist up the street. They love that. It builds such harmony and community when a new dentist opens up the street and he thinks, oh, you're going to think I'm competing with you. I'm going to steal your patients. And next thing he knows, a patient walks in needing a root canal built up and crowned. And they say, who referred you? And they say, Howard Fran up the street. He couldn't get me in today. And he said, you were fantastic and you're straight out of school. So you're up on all the latest techniques. And uh, same thing with the specialist. Uh, you know, your specialists, many of them, the top half, they'll, they'll, they'll understand your emergencies. And they'll say, hey, I don't have time to do the whole root canal, but I'll get them in, I'll open it up, I'll get them on antibiotics or pain meds or something. Uh, the top two reasons cited for not getting a six month cleaning when you have indemnity dental insurance that pays 100% for clean exam and x ray is difficulty leaving work, difficulty getting appointment. I mean, come on, these cleaning exams and x rays, they're free. Nike has to get you to part with 60 bucks to give you a pair of shoes. McDonald's has to part with, you know, three, four, five bucks to sell you a Happy Meal. You have a hard time selling stuff for free. And it's because difficulty in leaving work, a third of Americans can't leave work eight to five in those year hours. And then when's your lunch? Oh, you know, <clears throat> maybe they can do it on their lunch hour. But oh, but you take lunch at the same time. It's crazy. And then you know what? Eight to five in the big city, your staff is leaving an hour early because they got to fight the eight o'clock traffic and uh, they hate that. Then they get off at five and the five o'clock traffic. You know how many offices I've said, I've seen that said, well, you know, my eight o'clock appointment, it's booked up for four months for a cleaning, but I get you in tomorrow at 10 for a cleaning. Everyone wants eight o'clock or the four o'clock, the last one, get off work an hour early, but no one wants the middle of the day. And I'll say, okay. And then you're, uh, what time do your staff's kids get out of school? And they say three. So what do they, and it takes mom an hour to get home. So what, what, do, what do kids do from three to six? That's when they learn how to smoke pot, get pregnant, catch herpes, AIDS. Um, everything goes wrong after school till six o'clock. I said, if your eight o'clock's the most busy, why don't we go six to two? Now your staff leaves at 15 minutes till, the interstates are empty, and your eight o'clock, which is booked up for four months in advance, now your six o'clock, seven o'clock, and eight o'clock are booked up four months in advance. And then you take a lunch from 11 to 12, and then at 12 o'clock to one, now you're open at lunch. And now your staff gets off at two or 2.30 or three, and they get home, no traffic, before the kids get home. Can you imagine the look on your kid's face and they're walking through the front door and they got their girlfriend and a pack of cigarettes and they open the door and there's mom. And they're like, mom, mom, I thought, I thought you'd get off at five and I'll get home till six, what's this? And uh, so follow the market. Um, difficulty leaving work, difficulty getting an appointment, those are your hours. And you always say to me, I know, I have banker's hours. Come on guys. That's 20 years ago. Do you know of any bank that's not 24-hour ATM machines? Um, they're putting the banks in the grocery stores and 24-hour Walgreens and 24-hour Walmarts. My God, I can do banking 24 hours a day, seven days a week in practically of any of the 38 countries I've lectured in. Um, you gotta be available and accessible. Um, Healthier has got to be abundant. Um, available is one that can be used and usable, can be reached, and is very handy. Um, accessible is easy to approach or enter, easily understood, obtainable, and generally appreciated. Uh, focus on this. Um, and I'll end this with uh, my favorite Ralph Waldo Emerson quote. The reasonable man spends his life trying to adapt himself to the world. The unreasonable man persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress is dependent upon the unreasonable man. Think about that. Thank you very much.
the virtue dignitas, or dignity, a sense of self-worth and personal pride. Help your patients maintain their dignity and save their teeth by practicing minimally invasive dentistry. You can learn a lot more about that with our free CE section online at dentaltown.com or hygienetown.com and help you improve your efficiencies and techniques. Speaking of a sense of self-worth and self-pride, I think that offering CE online at Dentaltown is something that has made Howard and I very proud to be able to offer that to you. It's free. Log on, check it out, and take one of the courses. But Judith, isn't a pride one of the seven corporal sins? You can't say, no. you can't say the virtue of dignity, then say we're proud. <laughs> pride can be a good thing. Pride can be a good thing. But dignity is very, very important. And Bob Ibsen, another great bald dentist in dentistry, notice that uh, Dawson and uh, Ibsen and myself, all the, all the great dentists are bald. I've noticed that. Maybe I have a bias. But Ibsen is 73. I'm 43. And Dr. Ibsen, it, you know, it took a couple years to beat me down where he kept saying, Howard, the market wants minimally invasive dentistry. Why are you filing down their teeth? Why are you condemning teeth retreatment? How come you're sending in um, impressions to his lab for serenate veneers and they're all prepped? And I kept saying, Bob, if you don't prep the teeth, they're gonna look like chiclets. And he said, Howard, I've been, I was doing this before you were born. I wrote the first book in aesthetic adhesive dentistry, which I have from Bob autographed and signed, along with the first three books ever written by G.V. Black, which my sweetie got for me. Uh, for Christmas one year. One book was 1898, one was I think 1901, 1903, autographed and signed by G.V. Black himself. And uh, he was saying, these patients don't want their teeth filed down. I've been doing this before you were born. Trust me, I finally did my first case. And here's a patient, uh, I don't know if I can say his name with HIPAA, we'll just call him Bruce. <laughs> and uh, my gosh, Bruce is a 40 year old man, tall, dark and handsome. Uh, Cheesehead from Wisconsin, one of those weirdos who likes Brett Favre instead of the Phoenix, Arizona Cardinals. And uh, he simply was a man and he didn't want his teeth all filed down. I simply took an impression, no shots, no numbing, no drilling. I mean, the first impression went literally after he had his teeth clean in the hygiene chair, simply ran in there and took a um, polyether, vinyl polyether um, impression. Um, and Impergum and the Pentamix mixer. I mean, how long did that take? Wasn't even another appointment. Um, had him back two weeks later, cemented these, veneer, these veneers. Oh my God, he loved them. In fact, to tell you the truth, when I handed him the mirror, he looked at that and he was verklempt. I mean, he was teary-eyed. I mean, he gave me a hug. I mean, he loves these things. He told me also, he'd been married to his wife for 15 years and she made no bones about it. She let him know, your teeth bug me. I don't like your teeth. They still went on to have two kids and married 15 years, but she wanted him to get his teeth fixed. He's a conservative guy from Wisconsin. He didn't want to file them all down. We did this. He absolutely loved it. And that's what Adam Smith was saying, the first great economist in 1776, the same year, Thomas Jefferson, two 32-year-old men, uh, one in Scotland, one in America, one boat, one boat about economics, and the other one wrote a free markets and one wrote about free people and when they collided you had the United States of America and Adam Smith was saying 225 years ago you cannot dogmatically force feeds the needs of the marketplace what do these people want um, Bob Ibsen says the teeth are the picture the lips are the frame that's why women's teeth look so much more beautiful because they can use lipstick dark lipstick when a woman puts on dark lipstick her teeth like literally uh, uh, jump out of the picture. And amalgams, there's no mercury toxicity. Amalgam is metal, they last far longer than composites. Composites are inert plastic, anything can grow underneath a uh, composite, uh, just like mold can grow in a milk can, uh, milk carton. But amalgams are stronger, they last longer, they're better, but you know what? The marketplace says they're ugly. And uh, why? I don't know. Um, you know, all my feelings are gold simply because the gold is softer, more malleable, can change shape as the tooth changes shape. But the marketplace doesn't want them. 
And I thought amalgams were far better. I did them all through dental school. I did them the first three years I practiced. Every time someone wanted a composite, I would give them all this research showing how amalgams are better, amalgams are longer. A lot of dentists always say, well, composites last longer than amalgams because they're adhesive dentistry and they glue the two walls together. And amalgam weakens the tooth and acts as a wedge and look at all these cracks. You know, they want to believe their own baloney. Um, let them believe it. But, you know, just because you say it doesn't mean it's true. There's a little thing we called research, facts, statistics. Amalgams last longer. The marketplace hates them. They hate them with a the passion. So these composites, they, they like them better. Um, you know, veneer, same thing. I uh, When I did some of my early veneer work, I found this lab in Idaho, charged like 230 a unit lab bill, and they put in translucencies and, and all these... Uh, uh, million lobes and ridges and and they would darken the the gingival third to like an a35 then bring out like maybe a b1 on the incisal third with translucency and they look so natural and the women look at us oh why, why are these ridges here and and they why is it darker up here and the more beautiful they look to dentists who was trying to just capture completely all natural and i'm telling you uh, over and over and over women aren't looking for natural um i mean look look at their breast augmentation it looks like they're anti-gravity pointing up at jupiter um lipstick doesn't look natural Old lady beauty is the weirdest. You lean them back in their chair, they're 70 years old, they plucked out their entire eyebrow and drawn it in with a pencil. You're like, God, I mean, what would possess someone to go to the bathroom, pluck out their entire eyebrow and draw it in with a pencil? I mean, they look like a, a clown. They look like a freak. But this is what she wants. I'll never, never forget visiting uh, Judith's grandmother, uh, Martha, she was 96, 98, 99. You go into her bathroom, she's got the powder puff thing. I've got more hair than she does. You know, she's putting on lipstick that, you know, I mean, I mean, women don't look for all natural. They have this idea of what they want to look like and they like chiclet white teeth. They want piano keys. They want to bite down on a, on a ruler and all the teeth hit. They don't like cuspids. They don't like emergence profiles. And sure, some of these teeth, um, look a little, you know, I mean, I guess the daughter wanted veneers to match her mom's denture. I don't know. Uh, but the bottom line is, this is what they think looks good. And if they want to pluck out their eyebrows, draw them with pencils, teeth that look like chiclets, uh, no anatomy, no uh, stain grooves, um, you know, rouge, mascara, eyelids. I have one person I know, a patient, where they've actually tattooed their eyelid in there. I mean, Women take beauty to just very, very bizarre levels, but the bottom line is don't dogmatically force feed the market. If they want a tattoo, they want a tattoo. On my staff, I'm, I've been surprised at my staff. I think, I think over half of my staff um, has a tattoo. They get them on their lower back. They get them everywhere. Bottom line is that's what they think is beautiful, and if they think that's beautiful, it makes them feel better, and you just got to ride along with it. Mental health is far more important than dental health. Dan Fisher, president and founder of Ultranet, says this over and over and over. Um, this is why a lot of times on little kids, you know, um, they have two or three cavities, but they're like four and they're a little gun shy. And I'm thinking, you know what, I'm really not concerned with their dental health as far as their mental health. Uh, I want to get one more appointment underneath them. Um, or maybe next time we'll um, add gas. Well, you know, I got to wait till they get okay with the hygienist before someone goes and gives them a shot because what I don't want to do is in trying to save three baby teeth, make them have, be dental phobics for the rest of their life. And um, little kids come in, we got fluoridated water, they're drinking well water, God only knows what water they're drinking. They get these little stains, they want them removed. And um, a little pool cleaner works perfect on these. Uh, muriatic acid, which is just hydro hydrochloric acid with a little bit of pumice, removes stains. Uh, little chips with composites. Um, space between the teeth, I don't know what's wrong with space. I think Dave Letterman's a good looking guy. He's got a big gap between his teeth, but other people don't like that gap. You notice Madonna. I always tell women who want to close their diastema, the space between their front teeth, Madonna has a diastema, and that usually works against me. Most women cringe at Madonna and don't think of her as any kind of a beauty fashion. Um, and, but they just want the space closed. I have no idea what's wrong with the space between the front teeth. Um, you couldn't get me to wear a wig or have hair transplants with a gun to my head. Uh, well, maybe with a gun to my head, but that would be about what it would take. Um, you know, these brown stains, wigs people out, little muriatic acid, little pumice, removes them. 
Um, these little hypocalcifications, it's amazing how just a little bit of reduction, you know, not even a half a millimeter, and fill it in with a really translucent composite, something like Verilink by Ivoclair, and they're gone, they just erase them. But beauty is a part of mental health, and sometimes we have to match their dental health to really make them feel good with their mental health. And um, little boys, it's so funny on these trauma cases when they clip out their front teeth. I've been doing this for 20 years. It's always boys. Um, is it amazing? In fact, in forensic dentistry, if your front tooth is missing, root canal crowned, it's a 90% chance you're a boy. For 20 years, I've always been asking them, um, even if they're 40, 50 years old, what were you doing to get this? Oh, that your sister wouldn't have done. Oh, I fell off a bike, I ate a curb, I got in a fight, my buddy threw a bottle at me. I mean, I had a kid the other day, he was getting a drink and his best friend shoved him into the drinking fountain and clipped his two front teeth off. I told him, what are best friends for? Uh, but um, consider this, if you always do what you've always done, then you will always be, um, you will always be uh, the same. So. Basically, or another way to look at it um, is methodology without rationale is like memory without understanding. Patients don't like shots. They want minimally invasive dentistry. Um, I don't, I'm not a big fan of sealants, especially on permanent teeth. Um, Rella Christian just told me a week ago. Um, I was lecturing in, um, at the World Congress of Minimally Invasive Dentistry, and what an honor it was to have my wife and Rella Christian in the front row. And I asked Rella during the seminar, I said, Rella, uh, uh, how long do you see this last? And she goes, about a year. And uh, I said, and I gave her the microphone. She explained it. They do them at CRA. It doesn't matter who does them. I mean, they're just, they just get chewed off, broken away. And so you do a sealant. A lot of insurance companies won't cover them on adult teeth. And they don't last very long. But you sit there, and they don't want a shot. You get a, a water lace laser. You get some micro air abrasion. And these are cleaned out with um, aluminum oxide, uh, 300 PSI. And um, these are cleaned out. I think it was a creative Mach 5 unit. And then we put flow in a little uh, clear fill SC, a little um, Ivoclair uh, um, helium molar or Tetrix Ceram. And now we get to build these out. It's a composite. Two of those done, takes 15 minutes, no shots, no drill. Patients love that stuff. And when I do a, an occlusal composite, or what you might call a preventative resin restoration, um, that basically was measured on the dying net to be greater than 25 usually. And um, <clears throat> I know five years from now, those are still going to be there. Today is the tomorrow that we talked about yesterday. Um, a great way to show these to the patient is use caries indicator. I like Seek by Ultradent, and I'll put Seek on the occlusal surfaces, rinse them off, and the patient can see the decay stain. And I tell the patient, you know, if this was your house and you saw termites barely eating into the side of the wall, you wouldn't say, oh, well, it's too small to fix. I'm going to wait till you know, they've eaten at least two or three walls or get into the attic. When you see termites eating into your house, you stop them at their smallest. But so many times in dentistry, we just wait till they get really, really big, and then we drill them out and put a really big filling. Um, I think minimally invasive dentistry means when you find these things, you nip them in the butt before they get started. And then these are cleaned out with a uh, bio lace, uh, a water lace laser. And, uh, you know, patients are impressed. No shots, uh, no drilling, just a laser. Um, consumerism is about cell preventative dentistry over yesterday's drill, fill, and bill. Practice minimally invasive dentistry and don't ever break the golden rule. This is what you would want done to you. It is the fate of yesterday's heresies to become today's truth, according to Huxley. And... Tim Rainey, who's uh, literally an Albert Einstein genius freak research dentist down in Refurio, Texas, um, he was, you know, everybody would talk about on maxillary molars that you don't want to drill across the transverse ridge, it weakens the tooth. And Rainey was saying, well, if the maxillary molars have them, how come you don't talk about the mandibular molars? And he would take these teeth and he would section them. And I went down to his office a couple of times, spent two days with him one time, three days another, a couple of days another. I usually take my kids because he's got a big ranch and they have a lot of fun out there. And uh, sure enough, these mandibular molars have transverse ridges. And, um, and he's also showing how anaerobic bacteria, um, before water fluoridation and the tooth was really weak, cavities would be a mile wide and an inch deep. But now with water fluoridation, enamel is so resistant to decay that if the cavity gets through there in a small hole, um, now it's the, the tooth structure um, is um, 
prevents oxygen and they go in with a little hole, then they mushroom out. So they go in, now cavities are an inch wide and a mile deep. They're upside down mushrooms. Here's showing what they now call officially the rainy ridge on a mandibular molar. Uh, where you clean all this out, you continually have a transverse ridge. Um, you don't see it because you weren't looking for it. But once you start looking for it, you realize it's there. And that really changes your strategy of just taking a diamond drill and blowing out the transverse ridge on the maxillary molars, which you don't do. Usually on the upstairs, you'll do like an MO and a DO to preserve the transverse ridge. But on a mandibular, you'll just do an MOD. And remember that transverse ridge is there. Um, here's another case. Your diagonal readings on this was like 75. And then you take a water lace laser, clean this thing out, and preserve the transverse ridge. So um, think about that preventative dentistry and uh, versus drill, fill, and bill. Thank you. Hi, my name is David Nichols. I work here at Fran Media. I'm producing this DVD here with Howard. Uh, one of the great things about Fran Media and Dental Town is the forward thinking of this company. Uh, not only does Howard run a dental practice, do that during the day, publish two magazines, but he also finds time to think up lots of forward thinking ideas as far as multimedia, uh, the CE, this uh, DVD series, and uh, it, it just never ceases to amaze me. And he'll come up to me with, you know, a, a grand idea about some kind of multimedia production. And, you know, in the past I would sit there and think, you know, this is a crazy idea. No one's ever done this before. And other people I would talk to would say, you know, no one's ever done that. It's crazy. It'll never work. But with Howard coming up to me and giving me these ideas that normally you would never do. It helps us think out of the box. And, you know, I'm just so proud to work here. And, uh, you know, the forward thinking just kind of keeps me going day to day because I know it's always going to be something new. And uh, with that, I'm going to introduce the next virtue, which is dignity. It's a self-sense of worth, personal pride. Help your patients maintain their dignity, save their teeth by mastering endodontics with rotary, endo, nitai, apex locators, and calcium hydroxide. And continuing education helps you improve your efficiencies and techniques. Here's Howard. Thank you, Dave. But you know what? Every time I talk to you, it depresses me because we're about the same age and you look 10 years younger than uh, me. So I don't know yeah, why that is. I think I must have had too many Sammy Davis years. And, uh, but uh, Dave is uh, fantastic, and he's the brains behind all this operation, the online CE. I mean, we're talking about DVD, but the online CE, we're so, so proud of that because it's not just American dentist, but we look at the people that sign up. We, we had 13,000 unique dentists take a CE course on Dental Town the first half year it was up. They were from countries. I'm embarrassed to say I, I had to look up on a map. I had to go to Google and find out where these little islands were and countries and basically six out of seven continents and it's just totally amazing but uh dignity is so important and in 1950 after world war ii pulling some person's tooth um you know it, it, it was very traumatic but you know it happened to your mom your sister your brother your dad uh, but you know you don't have an ear infection today and go to the doctor and they slash off your ear um, extracting a tooth is mutilation and you just have to learn how to save teeth. I mean, endodontics is just, it's a right hood to people. Um, they need to save their teeth. It's so important for them to save their teeth. Um, it's the most important dental procedure that you need to learn is molar endo. I mean, look at orthodontics. That's just prettier. I mean, orthodontics it hasn't been about the bite for 50 years. I mean, you see, one third of Americans are obese. I mean, do you really think moms have an orthodontics done because her daughter can't eat? She's afraid she's gonna look like she's anorexic. Uh, my daughter's wasting away. Will you please fix her bite? With the refined carbohydrate diet of America, um, there's more calories in a Twinkie than uh, anybody eats in the third world. Um, I'm telling you that ortho is cosmetics, but endo, my gosh, you gotta save teeth. Um, endodontics is in strong demand. 
as more and more Americans find it totally unacceptable to lose a tooth, the patient is always in pain, so they have to do it now. Endodontists also of the nine specialties recognized by the ADA, endodontists have the lowest overhead at 35%. And once again, go back to cost. The reason this is, is because in 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, molar endo was at least two or three appointments. They had to open it up, clean it out, and sterilize it, then have you come back in two weeks and run a culture, make sure it's all clean. And today, for a karyoendo lesion, uh, now all endodonts are doing them in one appointment. Uh, there's no reason to do it in two appointments unless they have periapical pathology. And then the research is very clear, as explained to me by Fred Burnett, is that um, you know you have to if they have a periapical radiation lesion, they have decay and bacteria outside of the apex of the tooth. Um, you do 10% better um, five-year survival rates by packing the tooth with calcium hydroxide and getting that infection killed outside of the apex uh, for two weeks to six weeks, depending on what you want to do. Endodontics is just so important. <coughs> when I was talking earlier about the orthodontic instructors, <coughs> you know, if you're going to do ortho for 10 years, I would take um, Brock Rondo one year and Richard Litt another year and, um, you know, just take someone every single year. It's the same thing with endo. You know, there's a lot of gurus out there, but study them all. I would take a steady diet of endo courses and ortho courses. I would list out every major one and say, okay, here's the top five ortho instructors. I'm going to get into ortho. I'm going to do one of these gurus a year for five years. Same thing with endo. Um, you know, just list out the gurus and start taking them. And once again, the United States um, has 19,279 cities, villages, boroughs, and towns. And only eight cities had a population greater than a million. 16,901 of the cities, villages, boroughs, and towns um, had a population of less than 10,000 people. And 8,675 of those cities, 45% uh, of them, had not one of the nine specialties recognized by the ADA. So you small town people, you got to get into endo, you got to get into ortho, or it's not going to get done. Because if it's not easy to do, easy to use, easy to get used to, they're not going to have it done. We have a ton of um, Brock Rondeau on orthodontics. He's got free online courses on Dentaltown. Uh, we got a lot of them on endodontics. Uh, get online to Dentaltown. This is a fast, easy, low-cost way to learn more about endo, perio, pedo, prost, oral surgery without having to shut down your office, buying a plane ticket, getting a hotel room, none of this stuff. So um, think about that. The demand for endo, implants, composites, and ortho is growing over 12% a year, while dentures and removal are contracting and almost everything else is flat. So when the economy is growing 35 to 4% a year and endo, implants, and ortho is growing 12% a year, I mean, do you realize that these are growing three times faster than the overall economy? Endo is also paid 80% by most third-party insurance companies, and most of all, there is nothing more gratifying than getting a patient out of pain while saving a tooth with only 35% overhead for the average endodontist. And this is also what I keep showing my insurance companies in the value chain is, why do you give me so much money on endo, oral surgery, dentures, partials, crowns? I don't need this much money to do endo. I mean, how much money do I have in a root canal? I got four or five good aperture points. What's that, 25 cents? I got some sealer, another quarter. Got some bleach, that's about a quarter of a penny. I got a rubber dam, there's a dime. I mean, I have about a dollar <coughs> worth of material. <coughs> no lab bill. Mostly what I have is simply labor, chair time. Um, so endo is just grotesquely profitable. And I don't think anybody in America should raise their endo fee for the next decade. Um, Barry Musikant, spend a day with Barry Musikant and his dental office for free. Barry owns Essential Dental Systems. And this, talk about a passionate guy. This guy is about 60. He's been an endodontist for about 35 years. You got one of the most successful endodontics practices in downtown Manhattan, which is always fun to go. Um, <clears throat> I love to go there. Last time, Judith, what was that Christmas play we saw with the children? A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, which really, really upset me, but I didn't show it to the kids. I mean, basically they were showing that the whole Christmas Carol is based on this deadbeat wouldn't pay his rent, and the horrible bad landowner kicked him out, and they made the rich guy that owned property a deadbeat, and then here's this loser 
And, um, and it, remember all the negative comments about saving money? And all? I mean, it was just, it was like a communist play. Um, I wanted to go see Fiddler on the Roof. Uh, but anyway, the kids didn't. But uh, he gives the most outstanding endo course. It's the biggest value. It's free. You get a play in Manhattan. And Judith and I, I mean, we grew up in Wichita, Kansas. And uh, my gosh, when you leave Wichita, Kansas, you go to Manhattan. If that's not um, unbelievable, um, I don't know what is. What's Stephen Buchanan's tapes? And then go to his hands-on course in Santa Barbara, California. That was another awesome thing. I mean, Steve Buchanan is light years ahead of everyone. Um, Barry Musiket. By the way, on Dentaltown, you know, I got to congratulate Barry. Um, Barry Musicant has answered literally every question anybody's ever asked on Dentaltown.com for free. I mean, here you have an endodontist with 40 years experience and a group practice with six other endodontists in the largest, fastest growing city in the, United, in the world, New York City. And uh, I mean, it's just unbelievable how passionate he is about dentistry, how much he cares. He'll answer any single endodontic question on Dentaltown for free, and he lets any single dentist on the planet come to his office. And when you come to his office, you just will stand there and observe. He blocks off two hours and goes back there with his own extracted teeth and does a hands-on course for free. This guy is truly a saint. Um, Kit Weathers is another one in Griffin, Georgia. Just unbelievable. He's out there south of Atlanta um, on the Macon County line where they filmed the deliverance. You know, you get a little nervous driving down in that part of the world. Um, but I'm just kidding. But uh, Kit's fantastic. Another bald man. Uh, take G. John Schofel's course in Dana Point, California. Here's a math freak. Um, I had so much fun flying out to Chattanooga, Tennessee and spending a couple days with John McSpadden. Um, I've done it several times. Um, um, one time I called him up and I just asked, and, you know, you, you only get what you ask for. And I said, John, instead of uh, staying at a hotel, do you mind if I stay at your house? And he said, sure. <laughs> and uh, so after the course, he had to pick his brain all night long until um, he finally uh, told me to go to bed. And um, spent a day at Ben Johnson's office, tall, close to Oklahoma. That was outstanding. I remember, um, you know, you only get what you ask for. This is back in, I think, in 1987. And uh, Ben Johnson opened up Tulsa Dental, and uh, you know I'd never lectured. I was a no name, and I I called him up and I said, you know, I was asking him this question, this question, and he said, uh, and one time he said when he's answering a question, he goes, you know, it's really hard to explain over the phone. I wish I could see you in person. I said, well, if I flew down, can I spend a day with you at your office? And he said, well, heck yeah, sure. And here I'm in Phoenix, and he's in Tulsa. I mean, Southwest Airlines, what was it? You know, 90 bucks each way, and spent the whole day with Ben Johnson in his office, one on one, didn't charge a dime. These people who truly love dentistry, um, they're passionate, uh, they make a religion out of availability, uh, they would rather tell you what they know for free than miss the opportunity to uh, inspire a young student. Um, I'm also stunned at the endodontic community, simply stunned at the far majority, and they simply don't have nitrous oxide. I mean, that, that is so unacceptable. The, these people, I mean, and they're thinking, well, you know, who cares? It's referred to by the dentist. I'll never see him again. Maybe I'll see him again. Probably not. I mean, they see everybody one time. Um, they don't, a lot of them don't take insurance. They want payment in full. But uh, endodontists should be ashamed at not having nitrous oxide. They have to know watching any movie. I mean, you go through HBO. If the movie has a dentist in it, the dentist is a murderer. He's killed someone. Who's that comedian that's made about three movies against dentists? Steve Martin, I mean, you know, I mean, if a dentist is, on, is in the movie, he's a murderer, he's a killer, he's torturing. When you say root canal to people in a bus or a train, I mean, I named my, my, my favorite turtle's name is Root Canal, and I love that little turtle, and uh, she's getting ready to lay a bunch of baby eggs for me. But the bottom line is, most people don't have warm, fuzzy feelings about a root canal. And to me, it's absolutely insane that these endodontists don't use topical, they don't have nitrous oxide, that they can't offer a Valium or an Ativan or a Halcyon to healthy people that come with a driver. Um, but you know, in a business, it, when you start off your business, it's like planting a seed, a grapevine. And you know what comes out is leaves. And the first five years, lots, lots of growth. Growth, 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 growth. But after a while, you start trimming back the leaves and you start concentrating on grapes, which are net income. And endodontics is 35% overhead. It's 65% net income. Most dental offices I analyze do cleanings, exams, x-rays, and fillings for a break-even to a loss. And these departments are subsidized by Crown & Bridge, endodontics, orthodontics, implants, dentures, removable, periosurgery, and um, 
with today's technology, with apex locators, with night ties, I mean, the root canals you can do are just exquisite. This is stuff that would take you hours and hours and hours to do with hand files. And you get these, all these little curved roots, and I mean, they look so pretty. I mean, it feels like you're into radiographic aesthetics, that you're doing a painting, a portrait. There's nothing more exciting for me than to see a final fill of, a, uh, of an x-ray, that little puff the sealer. Um, I would be called an endo, an apical barbarian. I mean, I always want to get to the apex. I want to puff the sealer out the end. Um, so I'm an apical barbarian. I'm not um, the pulp lovers who always want to uh, preserve a little pulp at the end of the tissue. But with today's technology, you can do endo today with half the skill and half the time to get the same result <clears throat> back when I got out of school in 87. And um, market segmentation, price elasticity, we've talked about this before, where as the price goes up, you sell less. When the price goes down, you sell more. So if you like a procedure, like some does, I mean, I love endo. Well, then quit raising your fee. And also remember that when you're doing um, treatment plans that, you know, you can offer a couple of different price points. So, um, like we'll take implants. Well, you just don't give someone an implant. They come in with dentures and say, well, you need um, eight implants on the lower and a, and a nerve, um, inferior alveolar nerve resection movement. And you need a couple sinus lifts and eight implants on the upper and two 14 unit bridges and the total cost is 50,000. That, that's a Learjet. You know, why don't you offer, well, we could, um, you know, you could, uh, you got a denture, we could uh, do nothing. We could reline the denture. We, for a little more money, um, you know, do nothing. That's walking for free. A little more money, we could reline it. A little more money, we can make you a new denture. Uh, a little more money, we could put two implants down there and your denture could snap onto it. A little more money, we could put four implants down there. Then your denture could really snap on, be really firm. Or gosh, for a lot of money, we could put six implants down there, do a free gingival skin graft off your rear end or something and put six implants there. In fact, put a 14 unit bridge that won't even touch your tissue. So, you know, practice market segmentation. Don't go into someone and say, here's what I recommend. Go in there and offer them four different price points. And cu customers are far more likely to buy if you offer them three choices. You could do this, this, or this. And give them three choices, they'll pick one. But go in there and shell shock them with a Cadillac because you think that's the optimum oral health ideal treatment. Um, we'll send a lot of them running for their, uh, uh, running for the bank. So think of market segmentation in your treatment plans and take a steady diet of every ortho, endo, periopedo. You know, if you can keep your, your continuing education to at least 200 hours a year, um, you're going to run a very profitable business. Thank you very much.